All right, so as we talked in the previous uh, class, we were talking about conveyance of the property, okay, and how uh, property is going to end up conveying, what's the process, um, how we basically break things down. All of that comes into the aspect of transference of the property, okay? Uh, how are we going to end up transferring everything? How we're going to end up uh, basically getting the assumptions uh, in regards to what if there's problems, what if there's title issues, all of those are going to be elements that are going to be of most concern. Okay. Now, in chapter nine, we're talking about transaction, uh, the process, as well as the closing. Okay. So, our learning objective this evening is that we're going to describe the steps that are involved in the transaction. Uh, as well as from the process from when we initially get a contract all the way to closing. Uh, we'll prepare a list of tasks that need to be done for preparation for closing by the closing agent. And we'll also list the tasks to be done by the buyer and the seller before closing. There will also be uh, describe a face-to-face -face closing, including where it might be helped, individuals who attend, and any special considerations that may be occurring. We'll also identify the items to be deposited by the seller and by the buyer in an escrow closing. And we'll also discuss the impact of the Taxpayer Relief Act and the Consumer Protection Act on closings. I will also identify the practices that are prohibited by RESPA, which everybody should have remembered from the last class when we talked about RESPA. Uh, that's the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. We'll also define the disclosures that are required by the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act and identify uh, items that are typically prorated at closing. Okay, so before we jump into that, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to try to take a, a stance, okay, in regards to what it's going to look like from when you very first get a client, <clears throat> when you first find a client that comes in all the way to where we are currently, okay, in regards to closing. So our goal here in this particular situation is we want to talk about the big picture. Now, you won't see this in any other class. This is going to be the only one where we actually take it from the very, very beginning to the very, very end. So what we're talking about today sums up your job as a real estate agent. So this one, I'm, I'm glad we fell this on a Monday after a break, because this is the one that you need to be most alert for. This is very important. So before you end up, it, we all understand in real estate, when you are working in real estate, you've all seen there's a bunch of junk or fluff, okay? Do you actually run around and say RESPA and, you know, uh, LIFRO and all these other things? No, we don't. Okay. We do our job and we follow the rules that are there. So what we're talking about tonight is the entire process of how real estate works from the very get go all the way until they move into the property. Okay. So this sums up what your daily tasks are going to be. All right. So the biggest and most important one that nobody spends a lot of time on is this slide right here. It's called the loan approval, all right? Tonight, I'm gonna to use a lot of examples and it's because of the fact is you need to be aware of these matters, okay? And it's very important that you're aware of these. The very first and most important one is your client, when a person comes into a property, when they first walk in the door, what needs to end up happening is, is that client, they, they of course, or most likely, they've looked online, they found a house that they love, that they got to have, they've looked on Zillow or Realtor.com, and they're just in dire need to end up having this class or this house, okay? They got to have it. So they come in, and they end up, as a real estate agent, they walk in, and they say, hey, Garrett, guess what? I wanted to let you know that I found this house at 123 Main Street and Garrett, I am so, so ecstatic that I am so ready to go over here and, and you know, I'm just so ecstatic to, to move in. Can you go show it to me? 
Garrett, do you think the first thing you need to do is if I send that to you, should you go show me the house, Garrett? Should that be your first step? What do you think? Yes or no? No, sir. No, sir. What do you think your first step should be, sir? Make sure that they're approved for a loan okay. for. Make uh, certain that they're pre-approved. Very good there, Garrett. We want to make certain that that person is pre-approved. Okay. We never want to go show a house without them being pre-approved. The worst thing you can do, waste of your time, is you go over and you end up, you say, you know what, I'm gonna go show this house. Well, guess what? Mr. Garrett goes shows me this house. Say, I'm looking at a half a million dollar house. And we go through it and I say, okay, Garrett, I'm ready to put a, put a contract in, I'm ready, man. He says, all right, well, let me draft up a contract. So he drafts up that contract. Y'all saw how long that contract goes. So he goes over there, he drafts up the contract, he sends it over to Mr. Eugene. Mr. Eugene gets it and he says, all right, Garrett, I will send that to Miss Linda, but I need you to send me over the pre-approval letter so I can show Miss Linda that she or that your client has the money to purchase the house. So Garrett's like, okay, well, let me go call Justin. Hey, uh, Justin, can you go get pre-approved? Uh, I got a good guy, his name's Keith. He'll get you pre-approved, Justin. So I call Keith. Keith says, you know, gets all my information. He calls back Garrett and he says, Garrett, I hope you haven't spent a lot of time with that Justin guy. Well, what do you mean? Well, he's only going to be able to get approved for $100,000. So Garrett not only just wasted his time, he wasted Mr. Eugene's time, and he wasted if Mr. Eugene told his client, which he should have, Miss Linda's time, so now you wasted all these people time when there was no need, okay? So in that particular situation is you cannot, you cannot, the key thing here is you can't go over and start off by showing the property. You should always get them pre-approved. Now, here's another thing you need to write down that's different. Not, I don't think it's up here yet. No, I'm not seeing it. You don't want to get your client pre-qualified. Pre-qualified and pre-approved, two separate things, completely different things, is not going to be up, especially up to my standard. Okay, at my firm, not, not my standard. Your, your client needs to be pre-approved. If they're pre-qualified, what that means is Miss Linda has contacted uh, Loan Depot. And Miss Linda has went in and she filled out all these numbers and she was kept going through and going through and fill out the numbers, adjusting them, adjusting them. And all of a sudden, now she's got pre-qualified for $500,000. Do you think, Mr. Eugene, that Miss Linda at any point, do you think Miss Linda went in there and she ended up, got, they actually ran her credit? No. <clears throat> that number, that pre-qualification just basically says this that Miss Linda, if all of this stuff she puts in here is true, then she would be able to be eligible for this. But we haven't checked nothing. So in that situation is, I could go in there and say, I make $10 million a month and I'm pre-approved for $100 million, but they've not checked anything. It don't mean nothing. It's just my word of mouth. Exactly, Mr. Eugene. So in that situation is, you got to make certain, everybody, that your clients are pre-approved, not pre-qualified. Very important. So pre-approval up to a certain amount prior to selecting a property. Extremely important. There are many, many, many different pro uh, agencies, real estate brokers, that they'll tell you, go out there and show, show them the properties. It's a good learning experience. Go show properties. Okay, I agree with that, but you should only do that on realtor tours. The worst thing you can do in, in, the, in, in this industry that really drives me crazy personally is when an agent goes out, say for example, that Mr. Eugene, he's just got his real estate license and Mr. Eugene is just stoked. He got his real estate license and you know anybody that walks in the door, he wants to go show properties. So Mr. Jacob walks in the pro in the door, Mr. Eugene, and he says, well, I'm, I'm thinking about buying a property. And before he can even say 
buying a property, Mr. Eugene's already got the MLS up and he's typing on that MLS and he's like, I, I, I go show you right now, I'll show you 10 properties, okay? Well, the problem is that's good for Mr. Eugene that he's out there, he's actually wanting to work, but it's bad in the sense that if I go over here and I pull or I'm listing a property and I see Mr. Eugene has went and showed my property, I'm going to assume that he has a qualified buyer. So I'm going to go tell my client, Mr. Keith, hey, Mr. Keith, just want to let you know, we just had a showing today. Oh, really? Yeah, we had a showing today. Well, call Mr. Eugene and see. So I call Mr. Eugene and he's like, oh, yeah, I was just showing properties. Now, what, what does that do? Well number, well, number one, the biggest and most important thing is to my client, Keith, I look like an idiot. I'm just letting people show my property. I look like a big idiot, okay? You don't just go show properties. Your clients need to be pre-approved. You don't go just willy-nilly driving around. A lot of agents will say, well, what else am I supposed to do? Well, uh, go get clients, okay? Real estate is about showing houses, but that's about probably 10 to 15% of your time. Probably 10 to 15. 80%, 75 to 80% needs to be you drumming up business, knocking on doors, emailing, calling, farming. There's a million things you need to be doing. Sitting in an office with a desk and your laptop playing video games, Miss Linda. How's that work? How's that? Is that, that how you drum up business? So, hold on, Miss Linda. Let me let me come back here for a minute so that, that you can tell everybody that. Let's put this a little closer. What'd you say? They're not going to come to you. You've got to go to them. You mean, wait a minute. You're telling me, you're telling me that I actually got to get out of my comfort zone and I got to go work? Whoa, I'm mind blown. Mind blown. You mean I actually have to get out and, and talk to people? You, I got to work. Yeah. I thought getting in real estate, you just sit in a desk and play on, play video games all day and money just check comes in your pocket. That's, that's not how this works. No. no, man, I got the wrong feel. No, the thing is y'all is that you've got to end up. You have to, you have to make certain that majority of your time is drumming up business. I saw a post this weekend. It's the most hilarious post I've seen. Woman ended up posting on this group that I'm in. She posted, she said, I have a lot of, or my husband has a lot of money. He owns three businesses. So we have plenty of wealth. We have plenty of money. So I can buy as many leads as I want. Currently, I'm paying the maximum in Zillow and the maximum in Realtor. And I have been in real estate for two months. And I've got no leads. She said, I get calls, but everything I get are junk calls. She said, I've shown properties and I've shown properties and I've shown properties and driven and spent a lot of money, but I have not got any qualified leads. My response back to her, did you get your clients pre-approved before you wasted your time? Well, my, my broker, which she was with a very large broker, my broker never told me any of that. They said, this will be a good learning opportunity. I said, well, that's how they keep you busy so that you won't leave their firm. I said, they end up, they want you to do that. You need to get your clients pre-approved. It's the most important part. You've got to get them pre-approved. After they're pre-approved, it's gonna give you that certain amount of how much they're approved for. And upon selection of that specific property, the borrower makes a formal loan application. So initially you're gonna get them pre-approved. Once they're pre-approved and they selected a property, then they're gonna make a formal loan application. Okay. And that's going to be, and you have to know this form, even though you're not a loan officer, you have to know the Uniform Residential Loan Application. That is the official form to make your application for the mortgage. Okay. 
Again, it is used by most lenders. That's where they'll catch you. Did I say all? Did I say most? Yes, all is not correct. Most is correct. And on this application, you are going to list your assets, your liabilities, and it's gonna determine your net worth. So if you end up, when you're doing the uni uniform residential loan application, if your client, I always tell my people this, if they don't wanna get a hurt like a credit ding, then what I tell them is I want you to list every single asset you have and every single liability you got. And if you're in the negative, most likely you're not gonna get approved. Okay, yes, Ms. Linda. On this uniform residential loan application. Yes, ma'am. That is for your client to fill out, not for the agent. Client will fill it out on a deal. An agent never fills it out, actually doesn't even see it 99% of the time. Yeah, you will refer your client to two or three lenders unless they have a lender of choice. You'll send them to two or three lenders. After you send them to two or three lenders, uh, what ends up happening is they will end up, they'll go through, run all the numbers online, and they get a figure. You yourself don't get it. It's just the figure, if that makes sense. Okay. Now, upon selection of the specific property, the borrower will make their loan application, which is basically the lender must provide the borrower with a loan estimate of all closing costs involved in obtaining and settling a mortgage loan within three days. Very key there. After they file, or file out, fill out their forms, within three days of the application, they'll end up getting their estimate. And it will break down their cost of their closing costs that they have. Now this is extremely, extremely, extremely important. These estimates are most likely going to be higher than normal. Reason being, if a bank tells you, Miss Linda, that your appraisal is 375 and it ends up, it actually costs 500, who do you think pays, has to pay the difference? The bank. The bank has to, not you, because they gave you a loan estimate. So they will purposely shoot it higher than normal because the whole purpose is, is if we shoot higher, what happens? We don't have to pay for it. It's better to be lower. Okay. So in that situation is they have to normally shoot them where it's a true faith estimate. It has to be as close as it can be. And it has to be done within three days. They will test you on that. You've got to know that, okay? It's extremely important. Now, they will look at the credit report. They will review the credit and they will look at the credit report and check. Now, I tell my clients this, and this is a prime opportunity. If you're gonna come work with me, I don't know if other brokerages do it, but mine, this is a prime opportunity to sell yourself. What do you mean, Mr. Nobles, by selling myself? This is what I mean. If a client comes into you, most of the time, say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Keith here, I got a question for you, sir. You got your microphone going for me? Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Keith, All right, Mr. you come up to me, and I walk up to you, Mr. Keith, and I say, hey, uh, I'm looking to buy a house. And Mr. Keith says to me, okay, he said, yeah, yeah, Justin, I'll help you. I'll help you, man. You're my, you're my friend. I'm going to help you. I say, Mr. Keith, I end up, I have bad credit. My credit is only 600. Can you get me help? What are you going to say to me, Mr. Keith? Yes, sir. You're going to help me. Yeah. You, you, guess what most people say, Mr. Keith? What do you think they say? No. I can't help you. No, I can't. Or they'll say, oh, you got bad credit? Yeah, I, I, I can't help you. That's the biggest flaw you can end up doing if you're a real estate agent is telling your clients, 
I ain't got time or you're not important to me. Okay. You have to, one of the key things, and I do this with my people all the time, we train on this. This is a prime opportunity for you to drum up business. Most people have bad credit, but if you have a good lender and you know what I know, you put those two things together, you can have a person in the house probably within a year. Yeah, it's not gonna close right now, but let me tell you something. Think if you end up getting, think if Mr. Keith got 10 people in one month and then within 12 months, those 10 people are going to buy a house. It's like a savings account. So say he ends up, each one of those 10 people is $200,000. Mr. Eugene, how much is that in gross, basically sales? 200 times 10. Two million dollars. Two million dollars, and if they all close with Mr. Keith in 12 months, do do the math here real quick. Let's see if it'll pop up here. Look at this. Two million dollars times 0.03. That's just him getting one side. That's sixty thousand. If he ends up, depending on where he goes to, depending on brokerages, some do 50-50, some end up doing higher. Let's just do on the low end. Let's just say 50-50. That's $30,000 in 12 months. That's some people ends up in that situation. That's some people's entire year salary he would make in one month. Now say he gets 10 people every single month helping credit repair. Multiply this times 12, and there's Mr. Keith's payday. That's that's within the whole next 12 months. $360,000. Now, is it worth Mr. Keith wanting to do credit report repair? Yes. Yes. You'd be crazy not to. Okay? So I cannot tell you how many times I go to real estate or talk to people and they'll tell me, they'll say, yeah, I talked to a real estate agent, told them I had bad credit. And they were like, yeah, there's nothing I can do for you, sweetheart. You just go right on down the road. Well, I'll take you. Come on over here. I'll, I'll help you. I'll get you back on there. I've helped multiple clients get into their house. And guess what? Often on credit repair, you can charge them a little fee in the beginning so you can live off of some money. So you got some cash coming in. It's not a lot, but it's something. But if you get 10 of them at that, that rate, that's still good money, chunk of change on the side. So you could end up doing credit repair, and then after you get them repaired, wham, bam, you make the sale. So what about appraisals? Well, what's the next thing? Now this one, this is important. This part right here, appraisals, extremely important, okay? This part right here is what will make your deal or kill your deal. It will make it or break it. The appraisal ensures that the property used as collateral for the loan is adequate for a recovery of the lender's investment in case of default. They utilize the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report form. This part right here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, you can have a transaction that goes smooth as can be, and you get about a week before closing and you're sitting here just foaming at the mouth for your commission check. And you get to the very end and guess what happens? The appraisal walks in, the appraiser comes in, y'all had it at 300,000, the appraiser walks in and says, yeah, this house is only worth 280. Well, guess what? There's a couple of methods. One, the seller drops down from 300 to 280. But if you already have a contract, the buyer said 300, seller ain't Justin. The buyer can walk in and say, all right, I'll pay the extra 20,000 on top of my already down payment, which ain't gonna most likely happen. Or your last one, they bag out and relist the property and they go and try to purchase another property. Again, very, very important that you understand these differences, okay? We have to make certain that as we're going through these, we're meeting these situations, okay? 
we have to make certain that we are fulfilling our jobs. Okay. Now, another thing, they're also going to look at the clear title. They're going to make certain that as you're going through these, that the title is clear. If there's a gap on title, that thing's not closing. That thing's not budging. That thing is going to end up staying. Okay. So in that situation, we have to make certain that our title stays clear as well. Okay. All of these are very important factors that must be done. Further, we also have to make certain that we get homeowner's insurance. We want to make certain that as we own the property, you have to hold homeowners. I had a client once tell me this. Client turned around and told me, said, well, Mr. Nobles, I can't afford my homeowners or I dropped my homeowners because it got expensive. Guess what happens? You drop homeowners and they find out, and I promise you they will, they will send you a letter that you must reinstate it ASAP. You don't reinstate it, then what ends up happening is, is they will go out on their own and get insurance for you and tack it onto your escrow. So you must keep your homeowner's insurance. Underwriting, this is the biggest one. <clears throat> So the initial person that your, your client deals with, the person that they initially talk to, oftentimes a mortgage banker or mortgage broker, is not gonna be the same person that approves the loan, okay? What I mean by this in this situation is, the person that is underwriting it, which is the underwriter, is gonna be the final authority of either approving, rejecting, or returning the package to process for further requirements. If in some situation we do not end up approving the loan, what occurs is that individual would have to either they'll reject it or they'll send it back for some changes, which that happens a lot. They'll send it back and they'll say, well, you need to get this or we need to get that or whatever, or we'll need to, or they'll approve it. And I'm going to tell you the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario that I've had happen in this point. My client went over there, client went over and uh, everything was going great. Thought everything was going perfect. Loan was going good, we thought. We were doing all the inspections, appraisals and all of this. Well, our, our client worked for the US Post Office. And so every now and then, the underwriter, the person that's writing, not the mortgage broker, the underwriter will end up Stephan, can you drop your head for a minute because you're blocking, thanks, sir. Um, when you're going through on this, we need to make certain that they went through and we want it to kind of also make certain that the underwriter will like say, for example, let's put it this way. Um, say Miss Linda, let's just put a hypothetical this way. Miss Linda works for the post office. Mr. Jacob is the underwriter on Miss Linda's loan. Now, Miss Linda has been talking to Mr. Garrett. Okay. So Mr. Garrett goes over in this situation, and Mr. Garrett ends up, he's the person, your mortgage broker. He's been talking to you, Miss Linda. Well, Mr. Garrett is constantly talking. Well, well, the thing is, is Mr. Garrett doesn't always know what Mr. Jacob's doing because Mr. Jacob is an independent third party that kind of reviews everything. So Mr. Jacob sends the UPS or the USPS, a verification of employment. Well, it's got to reach Mr. Nobles, Mr. Eugene back there, okay? Well, Mr. Eugene, if you're a federally organized governmental agency, do you think it's easy to get a hold to you, Mr. Eugene? No? Should be. Should be, but unfortunately, it doesn't, does it? So what happens is Mr. Jacob sends that letter to you or to the US Post Office for HR division, and it's returned to Mr. Jacob. Well, what do you think Mr. Jacob's gonna assume, Miss Linda, if he gets that letter back? He no longer, works there. He no longer she no longer works there. Uh oh. So now Mr. Jacob's gonna send it back to Mr. Garrett for returning the package to process for further requirements. And the thing is, is now Mr. Garrett has to call Miss Linda and say, Miss Linda, 
we just got, I just got notification from Mr. Garrett. I mean, Mr. Uh, Jacob, Mr. Jacob told me that your verification of employment just came back. You don't work there no more? Oh, you work there? Well, can you find out exactly who we need to send it to? And so she'll go find out. She'll call Garrett back and say, well, it's Mr. Eugene at 123 Main Street, blah, 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 blah. So he goes back, tells Mr. Jacob. Mr. Jacob sends it off to Mr. Eugene. Governmental agency, what happens? Sends back. Mr. Jacob gets to the second time, calls Miss Garrett. Miss Garrett, she's lying to you. She don't work there. She's lying. We got it back again. Miss Garrett calls Linda. Linda, why are you lying to me? You ain't lying to me. Well, we sent it again. They fine. You explain why. I can't explain because I'm there. Miss Linda will be like, I don't know. So finally, what has to happen is Ms. Linda has to go down there, go talk to Mr. Grossman, who's in the HR of her particular building, and Mr. Grossman has to get Mr. Eugene on the phone and be like, Mr. Eugene, we've tried to send two letters to you. Why haven't you received them? And finally, Mr. Eugene will say, what? Just fax it to me. Just fax it to me. So finally, Mr. Eugene or Mr. J Mr. Jacob will fax it. They'll get everybody on the phone together and they'll fax it to Mr. Eugene and then he'll finally fill it out. Well, what's the problem with all this? It may seem like, oh, that's no big deal. What's the problem? It delays it, especially if you're mailing by post office mail. Good luck. Okay, takes seven days to get there. Then it sits for a little while, then seven days back. Well, there's two weeks right there. Then you do it twice, that's a whole month. And most homes close within what? 30 days. So in that situation is, it's imperative, imperative that your client works and constantly is calling to make certain that not only their lender, but also their employer are playing together hand in hand. If you work for a small firm, yeah, it's easy to get a hold to the owner. It's easy to get a hold to the HR person. But if you work for a governmental agency, you got to get on the phone and call a million people until you get the right person. I can tell you just working for a school, an institution like myself, I can tell you in this particular situation, when you're working with an institution, you end up, there's multiple, multiple people. There's multiple. And sometimes I'll end up, I go talk to one person and I'll say, well, yeah, I work in HR, but I don't do payroll. So you got to go talk to such and such in a, another city because they're the ones that do payroll. Then you go talk to that person and that person goes, oh, no, 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 no. You, you got to go talk to such and such back where you were just down the hall. Then you go over to that person. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to go back way over here to that person. And then you go to this person and then you go to that person. That's how it works. Okay. So again, it's imperative. And I, I, I harp on that because I can't tell you how many times I've had real estate agents that they simply think this. <clears throat> I get, I tell my client what to do. Go talk to such and such. Okay. Now client, you go talk to such and such. And I'm going to go sit over here and play video games. Okay. Is that how it works, Miss Linda? No, you have to keep No, you got to stay on it. That's your job. And guess what? That's right. Some of your clients are shy. Some of your clients don't want to be around them. And you're running out of time. And let me tell you something. You want to get yourself sued? You don't meet deadlines. The number one thing that real estate agents lose their license get sued for is that they don't follow up with deadlines they don't meet their deadlines they think oh i can amend this contract i can amend it no you can't you got to have all parties agree to it and i've had it where people were like no you either get it done or we're out of here and then guess what happens and this is something real estate agents don't think about guys i've been there before when i was young dumb i didn't have a person that pushed me I ended up, I just thought, well, 
I miss a deadline, no big deal. That's how college is. You miss it. You can just get a late payment or they'll pick. No, you miss something. You end up, your client loses their earnest money. Guess who they're coming after for that earnest money? It's coming after you, the agent. The agent comes, Miss Linda comes to me and says, oh, oh, Mr. Mr. Justin, I, 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 I forgot. I, I missed that deadline and, and the earnest money got taken. What, can you write a check? Huh, no, I'm not writing a check for your mistake. Don't ask me. You don't do your job. That's not my problem. I will teach you. I will train you. I will help you. But you don't do your job. That's not my problem. Okay. Very important in this situation. The last and most important thing, final approval. Okay. The final approval is where it's valid for a limited time under the agreed terms and conditions. So once everything is done and the underwriter says, I approve it, when they approve it, it's called clear to close. You might wanna write that down. When an underwriter approves the loan, it's called clear to close, okay? And it's valid for a limited time. Don't think that, oh, we got clear to close. I'm good. I'm good for the rest of the year. <laughs> nope. Sometimes you may be good for 24 to 48 hours. And if your client doesn't close within that time, guess what? You may have to wait another 30 to 60 days. Okay. So it is imperative that you meet these deadlines. There is no point in this process that you get to go and no point that you could just sit there and whistle or play video games, okay, or watch TV. There's none of that time. You have a deadline that you must meet, okay? Now, before I jump into this one, I'm gonna tell you. So basically what's happened so far, your client has gotten pre-approved. Your client has found a home and your client has ended up, they selected the home and completed the approval process, okay? Now, all of this has not happened. The underwriting and the final approval has not all happened yet. They put it all in here, but these things are still going on in the background. Your client doesn't get final approval and underwriting and all of this before you do inspections. I just wanna make that clear. This is more stuff that's happening while that ball's rolling. So think of it as two machines running at the same time, okay? And you as real estate agent, you got to make sure both of them are running at the same time. Because if you stop focusing on this one and you're over here focusing on inspections and this one stops and this one keeps going and you go, 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 go. And then all of a sudden you get to the end and you're like, well, why, why ain't this one going? Oh crap. What? The deal's falling. Through. Oh crap. I missed the deadline. Oh crap. Now my client's got to buy the house and they don't have the loan. Oh crap. Now they're suing me for three times the amount of damage that I caused. Oh my God. Now I'm going to jail can't do that stuff. You have to stay on top of everything. You have to keep the ball rolling. You got to keep them both rolling. So that's why I tell people all the time, after they receive a contract, okay, after a contract has been receded, you better still be calling everybody, okay? You better still be calling and checking in. Just because you receded a contract and you let the, and this is the biggest one, <laughs> side note if you want to put this down most real estate agents they'll go receive the contract okay they get the contract they selected it got everything together they got the contract they went down and they preceded it they come back and they'll go into whoever their transaction coordinator if they have one and they'll go and they'll hand it to them and then they think okay good now i can go do inspections and then they go do inspections and then after inspections, they do the amendment and they get all the stuff done and they got it all ready. And after they've wasted about 15 days of their 30 days, they're like, man, I need to call in on that lender and see how the loan's going. Hey, so-and-so lender, how you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. So how's that loan going with ABC? What are you talking about? Yeah, you know that one that I put under contract, you know, about 15 days ago? What, what are you talking about? Well, you know, the one I, I you know, I, I receded it, right? What do you, I have no idea what you're talking about. You don't know what I'm talking, you, you got the deal, right? No. 
oh shoot i never sent it to you now guess what happens you didn't do your job you didn't notify the lender you didn't text the lender and told the lender that you did it and you've done 15 days worth of work and you've been doing all this stuff and guess what happened you missed the lender so you wasted 15 days the lender could have already had everything done and you ended up screwed it up and now that whole transaction may end up going down the toilet and while you're flushing that down the toilet there goes your client's earnest money down the toilet because you failed to do your job. And guess who gets to pay for that? You do. Not your broker. You do. So if your client put down $5,000 in earnest money and they lost $5,000, guess who's writing that $5,000 check? You are out of your pocket. Okay? It is imperative you stay on top of these things. Okay? Now, when we're dealing with inspections, so as you can see, there's two things going at once. So what you've done, you got them, you got them pre-approved. After you got them pre-approved, you ended up, you went and basically ended up, you looked at properties. Your client has seen properties, has selected a property. You have submitted a contract, the contract we've been talking about. You've submitted the contract, you've negotiated, they have signed a contract and it has been receipted with the title company. Okay, and you have now notified all agents, so you, the other agent, the parties, and the, the uh, lender have all been notified. After all that's been done, now you go and schedule inspections. You never schedule inspections prior to the contract being signed. I heard of a person one time worked at another firm. Nobody told him what to do. Nobody explained it. And he came on over to my firm and he ended up, he's like, well, I just go get inspections done first. You'd what? Yeah, I go get inspections done before we end up even putting an offer in. You're charging your client to go get inspections before they know, even know if they can put a contract in? No, that's not how you do this. Inspection comes after there is a contract that has been signed and it has been receded. After it's done, you put inspections where it's basically, it's the contingency must be resolved before closing. Home inspections are highly recommended for all purchasers, especially first time home buyers. <clears throat> Ms. Linda, why is it important that first time home buyers, why is it important that they know about the home, home inspection process? What's so important about it? So you find out a bunch of issues, basically. Major, Major issues. Okay. Is that is that a big thing? Yeah. It can add up money big time. You're exactly right. If you are a if you're a person that buys a lot of properties, you kind of know how much it's going to cost. But if you're a first time buyer, you never bought a house before, you don't know what to be expecting. You have no idea. So what happens is is after you've received a contract, you have a very limited, limited time to do inspections. <clears throat> so, for example, say that I end up getting a seven day period and I receipt my contract on a Saturday. Day one starts when, Mr. Grossman? Saturday. No, it starts Sunday. Sunday. Does anybody work on a Sunday? Nope. So one whole day of your option fee is what? Um, Wasted. You don't count Saturday. Not on that um, one. You count Sunday. Right. So you lose that Sunday. Right. Then you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now, you're right, Miss Linda. You're not losing that current Saturday. You're using that last Saturday and you're losing that Sunday. So really you only have five days to do inspection. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's fine. That's a week's worth of work. I can get that done. Well, here's the thing. Do you think inspectors work around your schedule? No, no, they don't work around your schedule. They work around theirs. I just scheduled an inspection. Soon as he could get me in was Thursday. 
Thursday. So think about that. If I wait till Thursday, that's four days gone. I'm gonna have my inspection. That leaves me plus one. Well, here's the thing. I end up on Thursday, I do the inspection. He doesn't get the report back to me till say six o'clock in the evening. I get my stuff back and I see that, oh goodness, he said in the inspection that guess what? that I need to end up, that I need an HVAC technician and I need an engineer to check the structure for the foundation. Yeah, now, guess what? He said, I gotta do those, but I have one day. Now, what do I gotta do? Yeah, I gotta pull something, right, Miss Linda? I gotta pull something to make that happen because not only do I have to have those inspections done within that day, but I also have until 5 p.m., and you better write that down. I have until 5 p.m. on the last day. I have till 5 p.m. on the last day. I don't have till midnight. I have till 5 p.m. So say that the inspector, the HVAC specialist, gets out at 10. The engineer comes about around 2. I get their reports say around four, and we find out that there's a lot of negotiation needs to be done. I have one hour to negotiate, and hopefully, hopefully, my other agent that I'm working with will actually answer the phone and, and negotiate with me. Because let me tell you, that is where I get as a broker. A lot of agents end up, they come in and they're like, Mr. Nobles, I only got 30 minutes left. What do I do? What do I do? Well, you better uh, go in and get your client to sign a termination and send it over to terminate the contract. What do you mean? I'm going to lose. I did all this work. Da, da, da. You failed to manage your time. You failed to manage your time. Since you failed to manage your time, you cost your client their house because of your failure to manage your time. So when it comes down to it, you have to make certain that you're managing your time, that you understand what you're doing. Because these inspections, while seven days may seem like a lot of time, seven days goes like that. Quick, gone. Look at today, it's Monday, and look what's ended up happening. We've ended up, we've already, we're already past the whole day. It's almost evening time. It's almost ready to go to bed and start Tuesday. Time blows by, okay? Understand, it is imperative, imperative that you understand that just because you order one inspection does not mean that that inspector does not want a, what we call specialist, where they say we need an HVAC or we need somebody else, okay? Now, now we're going back to the other one, okay? So we're bouncing back and forth here. So now we're going back to the other machine here. So remember, one inch machine is we're going out doing inspections, due diligence, all that stuff. Now over back over here, we're jumping back over to lender and title, okay? Now we wanna make certain that the lender is gonna require proof of clear title before granting final approval of the loan. So we gotta make certain that the title commitment is good. Did the title work that Mr. Garrett did, was there any gaps on title? Was there any issues with that? Sometimes you may get another party that will only allow your client five days to do objections to title. So what ends up happening in this situation, if the contract says five days to, to title commitment, and remember you got seven days to inspections, you're doing inspections and you're doing title and you miss one of them, you can screw your client, okay? Extremely important in these situations because if your client does not object to the title work within the time that's stipulated in the contract, guess what? Your client is what? SOL, sorry, out of luck. Your client stuck to that contract. You miss a deadline, done, period, done, okay? Title insurance, of course, there's gonna be a lender's policy and an owner's policy. We will go in those as we get to a later point, but there is the lender's and the title insurance, and we will talk about that in another class. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. 
But the key thing is, is understand what normally happens is after you submit your contract and it's receipted, the minute you receipt the contract, if you do it early in the day, they'll start working on the title commitment that day because they got to get that thing back to you ASAP. So if you have five days and you receipted it, let's say Monday, how many days you got, Miss Linda? No, you got Monday, all of Monday. It's from the time you receive it, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You have a total of five because you received it that day. Okay. But what ends up happening is, is what happens in that situation. This is where a lot of people get confused because remember, you got two things going at once. Okay. So the, lend the lender and title is over here doing its thing. You're over here doing inspections. And what do you think happens just in normal life? Everything flows perfect, right, Mr. Grossman? Everything's just perfect, no issues. It all works perfect, right? And what plan am I on, right? So in that situation, no, everything's going wrong. It's like a train wreck, okay? So what happens is you're over here trying to watch title, the commitment, but then while you're over here observing this, the inspector calls you and says, hey, uh, Mr. Grossman, come look over here. We got a problem here. So now you got both these things going at one time. And oh my gosh, you got to get all this done. And you got till five o'clock to get it done. And it's four o'clock. A lot of things going. Yes, Ms. Linda. Good question. And we can we we can't add to that. Yes, I do in my firm. I highly highly, highly, highly recommend that the client be at the inspection. Doesn't have to be both, that there's two of them, just one needs to be there. If an agent is at the inspection by themselves, what ends up happening is, is if something goes wrong with that property and they, the buyer was not there, it comes back on that agent and the broker. One client must be at the inspection. If the inspector, now this is one of the things that people ask me all the time, well, well, it conflicts with my schedule. I, I got another showing, not my problem, move that showing. The agent and the buyer need to be at the inspection, no ifs, ands, buts. No matter how much you trust that inspector, they need to be at that inspection, unless there's something, maybe an illness or something that they don't want them around or something, but it needs to be in writing that they understand it, okay? If they don't want to be there, it needs to be in writing. It needs something in writing from them stating they don't want to be there, okay? So, again, like I said, you're going to have multiple things coming at you at one time. That's why a lot of times my clients, they're like, well, I never hear from you. <laughs> it's because you're not there watching what all I'm juggling here at one time. You, if you ever see those, those commercials where they're juggling like this and they're just juggling and they're just juggling and then all of a sudden they fall and everything just goes everywhere. That's what happens when I'm ending up. I have what's, what I call, thankfully I've not had this happen in a long time. That's what I call a micromanaging uh, client. A micromanaging client is one that wants to know every single little detail that you're doing. Did you write your name on that yet? Did you cross your T? Did you dot your I? And you're over here juggling and all of a sudden you, you trip and you miss something because they're, they're taking your attention away from what you're doing, okay? One of the key things I tell people is yes, you keep your clients updated. The best way to keep your client updated, text them. I have clients that they like to talk. They love to talk. I get on the phone with them. It's a 50 minute conversation just to tell them I received the paperwork. That's all you had to tell them. Best way to do it, send them a text. Paperwork received, okay? You have to keep your concentration on everything. It's your duty to your client to observe, make certain you're watching everything. If you're busy, you work with your broker. If you can't work with your broker, you work with another agent. You work hand in hand, the team. It's not a, I'm gonna do it all by myself, because I promise you, especially if you're a new agent and you're coming on, it's too much in the beginning. You haven't got your routine down. That's why you gotta end up partnering with somebody in the beginning to train you the ropes. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Now, preparation for closing. So what's happened here, one thing I want to say, come back here for a minute. When dealing with inspections, after inspections are done, 99.9999% of the time, there's always going to be a problem with the inspector finds, period. It's just going to happen. Okay. You're going to negotiate those things. You will do an amendment to change the contract to have those things fixed. You have till five o'clock of the last day. If, and I've had this question, that's why I take a moment to explain this. If at any point your client ends up, you can't get your client to sign or whatever, or I've had this happen before. Agent goes over, one of my agents was, was dealing with a transaction, ended up, couldn't end up getting the paperwork and all, was working on it. Basically, it came down to the last few minutes, okay? It came down to about 4.30, it closed at five. The other agent ended up, was basically could not get their client on the phone to sign the paperwork because their client was at work. The, so the sellers were busy, the buyers were busy, everybody was busy, 4.30 and the clients can't end up signing the paperwork. And so the agent tells my agent, well, it's no big deal. We'll just wait till they get off at six and y'all just all sign, six o'clock. The agent called me and said, you know, I, well, actually they didn't call me, I called them and I was like, hey, where are we with that deal? How's things coming, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, no, no worries, Justin, no worries. They're, uh, they are ended up, the agent told me that when they get off at six o'clock, they'll, uh, they'll sign the contract. What's the problem with that, Mr. Grossman? It's too late. What also, it's, it's a what? It's a breach of contract. You ended up, you didn't meet your deadline. So truthfully, and here's the thing, okay? It was verbal is what happened. Thankfully, this agent, I know this agent, and we were able to get it in writing and everything so that if something happened, we were covered. But here's what can happen. And I've seen it happen before. Listing agent knows. Let's, let's play out this hypothetical real quick. I know that Mr. Jacob's house has, uh, we'll just say playing a hypothetical, Mr. Jacob, he has a house that he's wanting to sell. And I know that there's some structure damage. And the Miss Linda, you're representing Mr. Eugene here, and, and uh, you come in and you say, we found structure damage and roofing damage, and you know we want Mr. Jacob to repair those items. And I say, okay, Miss Linda, well, send over an amendment and I'll discuss it with Mr. Jacob. Okay, Miss Linda? Miss Linda sends it to me, and I go over and I say, and this is if you're a crooked person, I go tell Mr. Jacob, I say, hey, let's just, you get busy for a little while, and, uh, and we'll just miss the five o'clock. That's what we'll do, we'll just miss it. And then at that point, they have to still accept the property as is, they're stuck. They're outside of their option period. And Mr. Jacob says, okay, I gotta go somewhere anyway. So Miss Linda, she sent it to me about one o'clock. By four o'clock, she's calling me. Hey, where's that uh, amendment at? Oh, I, I'm still trying to get a hold to my client. He's really busy. He's got, a, he's got a busy schedule. He's busy. We'll get it there, Miss Linda. Well, I, I need it by five. Well, Miss Linda, I, you take me at my word. You, you, you're good. Six o'clock, we'll get it to you. Okay, Miss Linda? So Miss Linda says, well, you know, he says that his guy would do it. So I'm going to be nice. I'm just, I trust Justin. He's a good guy. Six o'clock comes around. Miss Linda's calling. Hey, uh, Where's that, uh, where's that amendment at? My client's wondering. Yeah, I talked to my client about that, Miss Linda, and he, he doesn't feel comfortable with all those changes. And y'all technically are out of your option period time, so we're, we're just gonna let it, let it be. Y'all just gonna have to deal with it. Miss Linda goes and says, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. My client is not wanting to proceed because the fact is they want to see fixed. That's the only way they're proceeding. He, he's not proceeding anywhere else. Well, you're out of your option period. You can't bag out now. You bag out, you're in breach of contract. You got to buy the house as is. What do you do here? 
well, that's this is how you do it. How do you make them do it? You end up, she put me, put pressure on me. She says, all right, well, Justin, if I don't have it by two o'clock, she sends it at one. If I don't have it by two o'clock, we'll be sending over a termination. Uh, well, he's, he's busy. Well, my talk to my client, my client said submit a termination if it's not there by two o'clock. Well, I can't get a hold to him. Well, I don't know what to tell you. We'll just have to start from scratch. You forced their hand. If he had a text saying that, that would help you. Yeah. Texts do not have any weight. A lot of people say text. Text does not carry weight. It needs to be in an email, and it needs to have their information on it, their broker's information. It should have a lot of stuff on it showing that they have it. A text message does not suffice. You have to have an email. And even with an email, sometimes that's not enough, okay? But again, it's imperative in that situation. That's why I could say, I could sit here all night and give y'all story after story after story. But the key thing is, is you have to be aware of these different situations because they do arise. And there are agents that are out there that yes, there are agents that you will get very close with and you will get to know and they'll be like your family. And that's great. There's no harm in that. I have people that I love to death. But then there are people that they are only out to look out for their client, even if that means being crooked. And in that situation, you have to stand your ground. I promise you, if you're working for me and you're coming up on an option period, you will not hear the end of it till I see the amendment signed. I'm the type of person that I'm texting you, calling you, texting you, calling you, texting you, calling you, texting you, calling. I'm gonna bug you more than probably the other agent, okay? Because you miss that, and now, guess what happens? If Miss Linda worked for me and she let that slip, and Mr. Eugene now has to buy that house, and he wants, and he now has to pay for all those repairs. Guess who most likely is paying for all those repairs? Miss Linda and Mr. Justin. Yeah, we're all paying for it out of our pocket. So in that situation, no, not something to play around with. Okay. Now, what about preparation for closing? Well, in this situation, after title has done their part and everything, the closing agent is going to prepare a deed and the closing disclosure. Okay. And this is going to basically be an accounting of the party's debit and credit. And you're going to have to know these two bullets right here. Debit on a closing disclosure is a charge to that party that must be paid at closing. While a credit is the amount a party has already paid and will be reimbursed. So, question. An options fee. Debit or credit, Ms. Linda? I'm sorry, what? An option fee. Debit or credit to the buyer? Debit. Credit. Because they pay that up front. Okay. Mr. Grossman, attorney costs for drafting the deed, debit or credit? Attorney costs. Uh huh. Debit credit. It'll be debit because it's a charge that has not been paid, okay? So when we're going through these, debit means that it has to be paid, it gotta be paid at closing, while credit, they've already paid it. And what are the things that have been paid prior to closing? Earnest money and option money. Sometimes the appraiser fee. Sometimes even the home inspection. But you got to be able to know those differences. It's extremely important that you know those differences. Okay. Now, another thing that we want to end up talking about as well, okay, is going in here looking at our preparation. So as you can see here, debit and credit, we're going to focus now on our buyer. Okay. Our buyer needs to have these things done. This is their checklist. Okay, Ms. Linda, do you need me to go back for a minute so you can finish? 
Go ahead, real quick. While she's doing that, I'm gonna go and continue to talk. So the checklist in this particular situation, what we're about to go into is there are certain things that a buyer and a seller should do prior to closing. There's a certain thing that a buyer and a seller should complete prior to closing. So the first one, the most important, is they need to transfer utilities, okay? Your seller, another side note for you, when a seller is listing a property, they should never, keyword, never do what? Turn off utilities. Utilities should never be turned off at all, period, comma, nothing, zippo, nada, okay? Not one thing should end up be turned off if you're the listing agent, okay? Your client leaves them on. But the buyer, if they're purchasing the house, this is my favorite one, love it to death, the buyer, if they're closing on a Friday, you should tell your buyer when to go down to transfer utilities, Mr. Garrett. Uh, the day after closing? No, sir. Day before closing, actually, if it's on a Friday. And I'll explain why. If it's on a Friday, and nowadays, especially if you're in a city, they now are able to turn off your utilities with a click of a button at their office. They don't even have to go out there to the property anymore. They just click on their deal and power off, okay? If your client ends up, the seller's gonna say, shut off my utilities the day of closing. If your client buyer turns them on on that day of closing, guess what happens? They're not gonna get that request until probably Monday. If they wanna move in on Friday, they're not gonna have power Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They will not be able to move in until Monday. The buyer should end up transferring utilities the day before closing. Yes, Ms. Linda. What if everything goes great and then the day before you're supposed to close, one of them is not able to be there or something crazy will happen and the signing and everything's been pushed off to the following. Then you call, you call the title or the, the uh, city and you rearrange it. Of course, you're not going to be able to solve every single situation, okay? It's impossible. Best practices is you wanna to try to do it the day before. Now, some people will say day of, that's fine if it's a Monday through Thursday. But if it's on a Friday, it needs to be day before. So it needs to be on a Thursday. Yeah, you might have to pay for one extra day, but I would rather pay for one extra day than have three days of no power, which delays my moving, okay? Now, they also need to file a change of address. And not only file a change of address, but as they get their mail, they need to be changing their mail if that makes sense. This next one, most important of all, cannot harp on this long enough here. Conduct a what? Walk through. You should never, never, you don't work with me, I, I want this burnt into your head. If you don't come on with my firm and you decide to go somewhere else, that's fine. But I'm gonna tell you, you should never, ever, ever go to a closing without doing a walkthrough. I have seen, I have seen a ton of stuff, y'all, a ton. One of the key things that I saw was the walkthrough not ending up being conducted. They go to closing, they sign, all party sign, buyer's agent ends up, goes, gives the key to the buyer. Funding occurs, tells the buyer, you go on over to the house, congratulations, you got your house, they're all ecstatic. They go to the house, open the door, 
and the seller allowed their dogs just to pee and crap everywhere throughout the whole house. I've seen it where people have gone through and ended up punched hose through the house because they were about to be foreclosed on. Buyers didn't know nothing about it because the sellers or the buying agent was so busy. Okay? You never allow your buyer to sign unless things are done. I had one that I remember somebody, a student called me on. <clears throat> Worst case that I've had and happened in a long time. One of my students worked with another firm, called me, said, Mr. Nobles, Mr. Nobles, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I said, what? She said, I, I work for this firm and, and you know, I, nobody's kind of helped me through this. I've just been doing it willy nilly on my own. And, and I got to closing and we closed everything. And, and my, my buyer went to go to the house and the seller's still living in the house and all their stuff is still in the house. They, they have not even packed. And I don't know what to do. I have no idea. They haven't even made an attempt to move out. What do I do? What do I do? I said, well, has it funded? Yes, it's funded. I said, well, then technically call the sheriff, call the police. What do you mean? If it's funded, that seller don't own that house no more. The sheriff will kick them out. What? Yes. She said, well, nobody's helped me. I said, well, you need to find somebody that's going to help you. Because the fact is, guys and gals, that's not something you want to look on you. That makes you look bad. Okay? You have to always conduct a final walkthrough. And again, it's to verify that all necessary repairs have been made, that the property has been well maintained, and that all systems, fixtures are substantially the same condition that they were in at the time the contract was initially signed and finalized. See, here's what I do. I end up, I normally, myself, I never let a seller repair nothing. Learned that lesson way back when I first got my license. Guy, most guys think that they're, they're Bob the Builder, okay? They're Mr. Handyman and that they can do anything they want. They got Lowe's, they got Home Depot, they can, they can repair anything. And we ended up, we told them they had taken a extension cord, somehow rigged it up to the electrical box and ran the extension cord all the way out to their shed, to power their shed. No joke, you had a extension cord it was just hanging out of the electrical box up the up on the side of the house, stapled down, and then ran probably a good 15 feet to the shed. Okay, Mr. Handyman there. So my client buying the house said, I want that fixed by a professional. So the guy it was one of those I'll never forget. The guy decided that we want it professional and we did not define the word professional. So he got online and he got edumacated in becoming a professional handyman. Went and looked up the site, it's like 50 bucks. You go get your professional certification handyman deal. And he went out and he went and instead of hanging the line, he dropped it down, dug a hole and just dug it under the ground. Instead of it hanging, it's under the ground. And we had a big old issue. Well, you didn't define the term professional. So now when I write contracts, I define it as licensed professional. But the key point was this. The biggest point was this. Was the fact of the matter is, is that you never, ever, ever want to allow a person to go over. You do not want them to go and end up 
basically the key thing is you don't want the seller to repair anything. Think about it from this way. When you trade your car in, if it's everything falling apart on it and the place you go, they say, well, Mr. Eugene, you know, we need you to fix the belt on the, the, the motor here. And once you do, we'll buy your car. Are you going to go get a high-end quality belt to fix it? Or are you going to find something in your shed and try to fix it? Yeah, he's smirking back there. As he knows, he's going to look in his shed and try to find something to fix it. Okay. So the key thing is you don't want somebody to be fixing your stuff with stuff that ends up, they're not, they, they are, they're selling it. They don't have no more interest in it. If they had more interest in it, they'd still be there. You don't want your client fixing things, period. Okay. So again, what I do is I normally don't even allow the seller to fix nothing. I just say, seller, give me money. We'll fix it after we move in. Mr. Grossman, you're buying the house. Mr. Eugene, you're giving us $5,000 to fix the stuff. You got five grand, you can go fix that stuff on your own. You go get your own professional, okay? But in that situation is, that's the key. It's the easiest thing. And do you have to worry about any, worrying about repairs or any of that stuff? No, you don't. You don't gotta worry about that, okay? But the key point that we wanna say here is, is that we have to make certain guys and gals that if you, they are gonna repair it, you do multiple walkthroughs. Another thing I encourage my clients to do, drive by. While you're in that 30 days you're waiting, you keep driving by that property. Keep driving by that property. I don't care if you drive by every night, drive by it. The buyer or the seller needs to know the buyer is watching them. If the buyer never comes back by until the last day of closing, you have no idea what that seller is doing. You need to be driving by. I always encourage there needs to be, if there's a 30 day contract, there needs to be about a 15, 16 day inspection. And then there needs to be your last inspection prior. So you have first seeing it 15 days, then a day before closing. You've been in that property three, maybe four times. Okay. Do not ever, ever, ever have this occur. Had a client or an agent before call me. So Mr. Nobles, I got an investor that's out of Georgia. He ends up, he wants to go in and he wants to go uh, have me do a video tour of a property. Can, can I go do that? I said, of, cert of course, certainly, I don't care about that. She sends it to him, she gets it back, sends it to him and all gets back the information the guy wants to put an offer in. I said, I don't like that. Do not, do not, do not put an offer in till the client's seen it. Or we need something in writing. We got something in writing from them. They wanted to go and still put an offer in. I had to make an executive decision to go ahead and let it happen. Okay, so we put an offer in. After it's all said and done, the inspection, we said, all right, you need to be out here for the inspections. It's supposed to come out. Sure enough, inspection, something comes up. Can't be here for inspections. Right then, I told him, no, no. He can't be here for inspections. He needs to find another agent, another another brokerage. They're like, you're going to make me lose money. I don't care. You can go hit the door and take that contract with you. I'm not keeping that contract in my office. That agent ended up left my firm, went to another firm, continued to process the transaction, and ended up, came to find out that closing day, it was a scam. It's all a big scam. I don't even know what all happened to it, but I just know it was a big mess. You don't go and put contracts in if you've never, ever, ever, ever met your client. You need to meet them. You need to see them. They're out of state. That's fine. We're all out of state. But if you're buying a house, you will make a trip down. Any common, reasonable person, if they're going to buy $200,000, $300,000 home, yeah, they may ask you to go do a video tour. That's fine. You may put in a contract to get it under contract. That's fine. But they better be down here for the inspection. And if they're not down here for the inspection, that deal needs to be just dead, dead on its face. There's no point, okay? Further, 
The buyer needs to review the loan estimate and closing disclosure and obtain a cashier's check or certified funds to bring to closing. Did I explain to you on here the importance of wire disclosures? No? Okay. All right, I want to I want to go in and elaborate a little bit more than on this. I know we might have talked a little, but I want to elaborate more. It is important in this particular situation that as we go through, we want to make certain that when we're going through, that we have everything that we need to ensure that the funds are going to end up in this particular situation. We want to make certain that our funds are going to be wired properly. Most title companies are going away from cashiers and certified funds. They want wire transfers. The problem is, is that sometimes with a wire transfer, your client will get a phone call and they get that phone call. When they get that phone call, guess what ends up happening? They get that phone call and the phone call tells them, guess what? Can you wire the money? This is uh, this is University Title and College Station, Texas. Uh, yeah, can you wire that money that you're supposed to, Mr. Eugene, for your closing on Friday? Uh, we we had a change in our banking account. Uh, the new instructions. Uh, what's your email so we can send them to you? We need you to wire those to that that deal. And most people do what? Okay, wired. It's coming your way. Okay, well, Mr. Eugene, we got it. Uh, you're all set. We'll see you Friday. Click. Mr. Eugene gets the closing. Walks in there like, okay, Mr. Eugene, you owe us the, the money. Where's where's the wire? Uh, what are you talking about? The the wire. We need your money. You sent it. What are you talking about? Well, Mr. Nobles, look at this screen here. We don't. There's no wire here, sir. There's nothing here. Well, it's not here, sir. We can't close on this loan till you are. And what happens is you don't have it, you can't close. So you always emphasize to your clients, they do not, they do not wire any money until they call a university title or whoever title company is, they call that title company when they're at the bank and they verify with that title company. Are you so-and-so? I'm about to close at 12 o'clock today. Yeah. Okay. I'm wiring the money right now. They need to be on the phone with the, with the title company. They need to be on it. Do you see it coming through? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Click. They don't just wait because the title company is not just going to wire or send you or change stuff last minute. It happens a lot, guys and gals. And let me tell you, if the money goes disappearing and you didn't fulfill your duty to tell them that, you're in liability just as much as your broker now is and everybody else, okay? Not something to be playing around with at all. Now, what's the duties of the seller? <clears throat> this one is the most important one, which is the most common sense one. But unfortunately, sellers don't understand this. You need to pack and confirm your moving date and time. Can't tell you how many times I've had sellers who said, Oh crap, I forgot to confirm. Oh no, we can't move out. Oh crap, what do we do? We're closing in an hour and our stuff is still in boxes waiting for the movers. Should have had that taken care of. Remove any items that are not going to convey. That's with listing. When you list the property, everything in that property that's about to be listed, everything in that property needs to be removed, period. You need to put in a change of address and stop your newspapers. Collect any booklets, instruction booklets, warranties. Collect all keys to the property and turn them over to the buyer, but you only turn them over after funding, not closing. That is a key test question. You turn over the keys after funding, not before funding, okay? You verify that all conditions required by the inspection or other contingencies have been met. Everything that you promised you were going to promise to fix needs to be taken care of to their satisfaction. You need to arrange for a 
thorough cleaning of the property before the walkthrough. This common sense, common sense, and I can't tell you how many times clients won't do it. They refuse to clean the property before the walkthrough. I had one where my buyers went in, we opened the door, and I could not believe when we first saw it, it was immaculate, clean, pretty, everything. We walked in the day before, and I was like almost about to throw up everywhere it's not so bad. You clean it. It's common sense. It's common courtesy. You also need to review the loan estimate. And sometimes you'll have to require and execute an affidavit of title, which basically is a sworn statement to which the seller assures the title insurance company and the buyer that there are no defects in the title that have occurred since the date of that title examination, okay? At closing, in this particular situation, when you are sitting at closing, again, this is dependent on the state that you're in, but depending on the state law and their local custom, closings will be conducted through either A, a licensed escrow company, in which the case, uh, the parties may execute documents separately and they never meet, okay? That happens in Texas. Or they can be a face-to-face -face meeting of the parties at the escrow company, title company, lender's office, or attorney's office. Same situation. In Texas, we can do an I either or. You can either do face-to-face -face and you both see each other, or you never meet. You never see what each other look like ever in your life, okay? But again, these are the two separate options. In an escrow closing, an escrow holder, which is called an escrow agent, is going to be a disinterested third party authorized to coordinate the closing activities. Now, this person in Texas is oftentimes going to be a notary public. This is what's called a loan closing specialist. Okay, and if any of any people ever want to know how to do this, it's real simple. The job's simple. All you do is you end up a title company or a lender, whoever will contact you. They'll say, uh, Mr. Garrett, uh, you ended up, you wanted to, uh, we need you to close a loan for us. Uh, the parties get off at seven o'clock and they need somebody to close, do a mobile close at their house. Uh, we'll pay you 175 or 200 bucks to go out there and close the loan for us. Takes you approximately about an hour, hour and a half at the longest. You go out, you sign the paperwork, you put it in an envelope, you mail it back to them, and you get your money after closing has occurred. This basically is a closing specialist. All you've got to have is a notary uh, license and you have to be certified. That simple. Certification courses, I mean, I teach them. It's like a weekend's worth of work. One weekend, you get certified, and you can end up start practicing and making extra cash on the side. A lot of real estate agents that are that are knowledgeable end up doing this, okay, uh, just so that they have side money. Another one, like I said, the broker, of course, turns over the earnest money to escrow agent who deposits it into a special trust or an escrow account, and the buyers and sellers turn over the required documents and deposit to the escrow agent prior to closing. That's one method that can end up being utilized. Now, understand that the IRS may require completion and submission of a Form 1099-F for a statement of income to the seller showing the seller's social security number. And the seller may be exempt from paying though capital gains tax under the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997. Okay. If you are a single person, you get $250,000 capital gains tax exclusion. If you are married, you get $500,000 taxable relief. Okay. So what that, how that works is say that Mr. Keith purchases a property, his primary property for $100,000 in Navasota. He holds on to it for 10 years. And Mr. Keith ends up after 10 years, Mr. Keith goes over, does his 10 years, he turns around and he now ends up, he sells the property for $350,000. How much of that do y'all think, 
uh, Linda, how much of that is going to be taxable to Mr. Keith? How much? Zero. Because what was his cost of the property? 100000 He sold it for 350 You don't count the cost. You count only the profit. Three fifty minus a hundred leaves him what? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. How much did I tell you was his taxable exclusion? Two hundred and fifty thousand. Therefore, Mr. Mr. Keith owes zero in taxes on his transaction. The key thing: there are certain exclusions, and y'all can read through those, and we'll discuss them as we get into finance. But again, these are some of the methods that are there. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. We will definitely spend a lot of time on this one in finance. It's the goal is to protect families from unfair, abusive financial practices. It's also to consolidate the accountability and responsibility, which is the Consumer Financial and Protection Bureau, which is the CFPB, okay? Again, I'm not going to go in a lot into this because finance, we're going to spend an entire section on this. You just need to end up knowing what that breaks down to. Now, the reason we bring it up is because of this part right here. It's called the know before you owe goes. The CFPB created two new forms to help consumers. So they changed some stuff up to make it easier. The loan estimate must be provided to the consumer within three days after receiving the loan application. The forms used to be called the good faith estimate and the truth in lending. These forms have now been turned into the loan estimate. The closing disclosure must be delivered to a consumer three days prior to closing, and it replaces the HUD-1 settlement statement. Now, you will still see the HUD settlement statement if it's a cash transaction. If you're going in buying a house on cash, they're not going to do a whole closing disclosure. They're just going to use the HUD. Okay. But if you're using financing, you're going to see a closing disclosure. That makes sense. Okay. Now, the loan estimate, of course, has zero tolerance, meaning that 10% limits on all other third party charges. There can only be a cap of 10%. And the changes that exceed the limit that the loan estimate must be reissued within three days, which then resets those tolerance. Things are changing. If it's going to be higher than 10%, they get to recalculate that clock over. Now, I'm going to tell you, why is this so important? Okay, why are these things so important? The main and most biggest one, we're not too much worried about this one. Not too much worried because if you're putting a contract in and all that, okay, well, you got 30 days. Even if we reset three days, no big deal. We still got 30 days. This is the big one. The closing disclosure will have to be reissued if, after it has been sent to the buyer, the lender increases their APR by just more than one eighth of a percent. You see that? Just one eighth of a percent then the changes to the loan product or as a prepayment penalty to the loan. When it is reissued, guess what? It triggers another three business, business day waiting period until closing. So say, for example, that your lender is doing all the work. Of course, what are lenders trying to do? Get you the what? Lowest interest rate. So they're keeping it low. And then all of a sudden, the Fed changes stuff, and guess what happens? Moves everything up, and everything goes up, and you're closing the next day. It bumps up an eighth of a percent. Boom, trigger three days. You can't close for three, three more days. Had it happen before. Client got everything scheduled. Everything was perfect. Transaction was smooth, sailing. Everything was just going perfect. I was like, I'm worried. Something's not right. It's going too perfect. Everything's perfect. Get to the very end, Fed changed the interest rate, went up a little bit, threw off all the numbers, 
We had to reissue the closing disclosure. Everything was a mess. Clients were already supposed to be out because somebody was buying their house. They ended up had already closed on their house. Now the person didn't have a house to go stay in. The three days got reset and it happened on a Friday. So the business day start as of Monday. So they were supposed to close on Friday. We had the change on Friday. The days did not count until Monday. So we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we could end up, we had to wait. So on that following Thursday, we were able to move them in to close. My clients had five days of no place to go. Five days. Talk about finding them a house or an apartment. It was hellacious. We'll put it that way. Okay. That happens. What was that? Nope. That's how it is. Now, of course, you have to amend your contract. But yeah, this is the rule. Mandatory three days. What about RESPA? RESPA deals with its old federal law that's enacted to protect consumers in the settlement process as follows. It requires accurate and timely information about the actual cost of the transaction. It eliminates any kickbacks and or other referral fees and it prohibits lenders from requiring excessive escrow amounts. The biggest thing you need to know about this for your particular situation, why it applies to you, <clears throat> way before this act was enacted, how did all these big companies stay in business? Well, here's how they stayed in business, you ready? They stayed in business in this particular situation. The person that had most of the money they would just put it this way. Mr. Garrett, Mr. Keith, Mr. Jacob, Mr. Eugene, Ms. Linda, Mr. Stefan, you know, Mr. Darren, all of y'all. Y'all come use me and I'll end up, I'll give you all, if you use me to be your real estate agent, I'll give you all a thousand dollars at closing. You just come use me. Well, here's the problem. Some of them, we give them the thousand dollars prior to closing. Some of them would give them a thousand dollars to refer people to them. See, here's the thing. You can give money back at closing. You can. But the thing is, is you can't give them money for kickbacks. Meaning I can't walk up to Miss Linda who ends up runs a, uh, a marketing company and I tell Miss Linda, hey, Miss Linda, you go over there, Miss Linda, and you you send all your people to me, and every client you send to me, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Wink, wink. That's a kickback. You cannot end up paying people for referrals. All you can pay, Mr. Grossman, do you remember the the amount that you can pay for a lead? That you can pay, that I could pay Linda. Do you remember what it was? Uh, it's fifty dollars, but it cannot be in cash. It's got to be in a gift card or fifty dollars of value, meaning like a, maybe a basket, a thank you basket or something. But I cannot give her fifty dollars in cash. So, well, the reason they did it was this point was we level the playing field. Because what now happens is, if you're Keller Williams, and I'm a small nobles realty group, Keller Williams has millions, probably billions in the bank. I ain't as big as them. I'm a mid, for my area, I'm a mid-sized firm. It levels the playing field where that we all can give the same amount, if you see what I'm saying, okay? But the problem is, and people don't understand this, is it really doesn't level the playing field. Because if you really think about it, what's happened is Keller Williams, Century 21, all the big dogs, had many years of getting to take advantage of this prior to this law. So their database is huge. So it's very still, even though they've got it into play now, it's still always going to be what? It's still always gonna be more them than you because They've been around it. They've had they've had that capability for a long time. 
And that was one of the arguments about RESPA was it doesn't really level the playing field. It really puts everybody that's a smaller one at a disadvantage, if you see what I'm saying. Now, it also prohibits lenders from requiring excessive escrow amounts because we don't want to have excessive amounts that are being required. We don't want Mr. Eugene to buy a house and they say, oh, Mr. Eugene, you got to put 50% uh, in escrow, okay? We don't want to do that. We want it to end up being where it is going to be fair to everyone, okay? It does not apply to a transaction that's financed solely by a purchase money mortgage that's taken back by a seller an installment contract, which are a contract for deed, or a buyer's assumption of a seller's existing loan. All of these in these situations don't apply. The disclosure also requires that the lenders and settlement statements or settlement agents do have to give that loan estimate. And closing disclosure to the borrower and the seller has to be itemized of all charges that are gonna be paid in connection with the closing. Even if, even if the client goes over and they paid the money in advance. So say that Mr. Garrett goes over in this particular situation and Mr. Garrett purchases a house and he ended up had to do an appraisal and he pays the appraiser up front Mr. Garrett still has to end up in this situation. He still has a duty to end up to make certain that he has completed or that it's been listed within his disclosure. He has to make certain that it is included. It cannot end up not being included. Okay. Now, when we are following are going to be the three changes that would require a new day or new three day review period. Okay, this kind of makes it easy for you. Okay. Increasing the annual percentage rate, the APR, by more than one eighth of a percent for a fixed rate loan or one fourth of a percentage point for an adjustable rate. Now that's decreasing the interest rates or fees does not cause a delay. So if they drop it a percent or two percentage point, it does not cause an issue if they raise it, okay? If there is an inclusion of a prepayment penalty clause, we have to reset it. And if the changes in the loan product, such as they're changing it from a fixed rate to an adjustable rate mortgage, that would trigger the new three-day rule. Now, there are also going to be certain charges that are going to be prorated. And what we mean by prorated is we mean in this particular situation that when we're dealing with this, that we're dealing with our proration is going to be breaking it where it's broken fairly amongst everybody. So say, for example, <clears throat> Mr. Jacob is buying your property, Mr. Eugene, okay? Mr. Eugene, you've lived in it from January 1st through June 30th. You're closing on June 30th, okay? Is it fair that Mr. Jacob has to pay from January 1st all the way for the year that you've been there? No, it's not. It's not fair to him. He didn't have access to it. Why should he pay for your bills? He shouldn't. So in that situation, what happens is, is we're going to prorate the charges amongst the parties. So in this particular situation, Mr. Eugene, you're going to cover and, and take care of from January 1st to June 30th, six months. Mr. Jacob will pay the next day, July 1st through December 31st, he will pay the remainder, okay? That's proration where we break it down. Now, luckily I'm a teacher and I've done all this study and I get to give you the easy examples. In the real life, they're actually going to give you something to the extent of Mr. Eugene has lived in the property from February 2nd, 2020 
through uh, on August 15, 2020. Pro calculate how much Mr. Jacob owes on the property for the, for the year. Now you got to go in here and you count from the 16th of August to those days plus September, October, November, December. Then you got to look up here at your chart and you got to look, are we dividing it by 360 day or we divide it by 365? So you got to look at what they call a banker's year or a normal calendar or leap year. So when you're reading your question, if it says we're calculating this off of a banker's year, you're gonna take it as 360. If they're talking about a calendar year, you're gonna take 365. If they say it's a leap year, it's 366 days. Okay, so you gotta be very careful with this, okay? Now, again, when we're dealing with these, we've gotta make certain that we understand how they're breaking them down. Now, of course, the yearly or charge is going to be divided if it's a banker's year by 360 days. That's the easy one. Do you think they're going to use that one a lot? No. Okay. They might, but they don't. So they basically account for there's 30 days in every month. That'd be easy to calculate. It's easy to count. What are they going to go after most likely? A yearly charge that's divided in a leap year. 366 days meaning you get to find out, and you got to remember how many days are in each month. How many days are in January? How many days are in February? How many days are in March? How many days are in April? You got to remember them, okay? So in that situation, you calculate the days, you round them up, you take the amount, like it says, to determine the daily charge, the actual number of days in the prorated period is determined and the number of days is gonna be multiplied by that daily rent. They're not gonna give you the daily rate. They're going to say that Mr. Grossman is selling his property and his tax rate on his property is uh, at the end of the year, $4,136.21. Isn't that so nice of us to make it just so perfect for y'all, right? We're not gonna round it up, we're gonna make it hard. And we're utilizing a leap year amount and Mr. Eugene lived in the property from June 1st, uh, 2020 to uh, October 15th. How much does Mr. Grossman pay? I like how we just, yeah, for those of you online, Mr. Eugene just said a lot. If only that was the answer, right? <laughs> so, but they're going to end up, they're going to, you have to, to write it out. You have to break it down. So you have to know how many days are going to be in each and every single month, okay? Now, in most states, including Texas, the charges are prorated as of the date of closing, with the seller being responsible for the date of closing. Even if you're out of the property, even if you've emptied the place out, which you should have, you still pay for the day of closing, even if that means that you closed, both of you closed at 8 a.m. on that day. And the buyer moves in at 9 a.m. You still pay for it because you're the one responsible for that day of closing. Again, you're gonna have to know these four items here. Taxes, mortgage interest, insurance premiums, and rent are going to be the four most common prorated amounts. Now my question everybody says is, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is rent? What are you talking about rent? Yeah, I'm talking about rent. Because here's the thing, Mr. Eugene might end up having a property that he's ending up that he himself is renting out and he's never lived in. He may bought a property just to rent it out to Mr. Grossman. He bought it to help Mr. Grossman out. Mr. Grossman's lived there since day one. And he's lived there for 10 years, okay? And Mr. Grossman has taken care of the property, maintained it, everything. Mr. Eugene has never been in there. And on the 11th year, Mr. Eugene sells it to Mr. Jacob. Mr. Eugene sells it. Well, the thing is, is Mr. Grossman still can stay in the property even if Mr. Eugene sells it. But any monies 
that Mr. Eugene gets has to be split with Mr. Jacob. Mr. Eugene, just because he sells the property does not mean he's still entitled to that lease, even though he signed the lease. When you sell the property, it transfers over to the new buyer, okay? Extremely important that you know those differences there. You have to be able to tell those differences, okay? All right, so with that being said, that primarily wraps up what we have for this evening in regards to our slides. So give me just a second here.